Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to the latest technology breakfast. First of all, I'd like to thank Michael Demosthenos and the team from RBS, soon to be Williams and Glynn, the technology specialist team. I can't see Michael anywhere. Are there? Michael is at the back. Thank you again, Michael, for hosting us again. Well, there was a bit of confusion this morning because last time we did this at 2.80, so this time at 2.50, so a lot of people turned up at 2.80, but I think most of you managed to make it across, fortunately. Um, so, blockchain Bitcoin, massive topic. About a year ago, I asked one of my children what blockchain was, and he refused to tell me, so I've had to learn for myself. Um, <laughs> our speakers today are Angus Banks, sort of, of CIO of Skimlinks. He's a serial technology entrepreneur who incidentally went to school with me. He claims to be younger than me, but I don't believe it. Um, he's got a history of, sort of set, setting up and selling technology companies in both the UK and the US, and he's a very was a very early advocate of the merits of Bitcoin and before blockchain really started to be talked about in a wider sense. In fact, he did advise me when I had lunch with him a few years ago to buy Bitcoin for all my children. At that stage, they were, I think, about 200 pounds a shot. And I ignored the advice, as I usually ignore good advice. And they subsequently went up to about 750, and I was kicking myself severely. They went down, but they're still higher than where I should have bought them at. And I'm sort of much more successful than most investments I did make. So I'm sorry I didn't listen to you, Angus. I will next time. Um, we also have George McDonough here from No Man Ventures. He manages the marketing for an array of blockchain ventures. And his particular focus is on Ethereum, which are about which more are none. And then we have completing the speaker lineup this morning, my colleague, Raoul Lum, over here, who's going to talk very briefly, because I try and keep the law down to a minimum, because I know it's fundamentally quite boring for most people, not for us, of course, um, talk about some of the legal implications of Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, yeah, people think still sometimes when I talk to them or start talking about blockchain, I think this is some sort of geekish obsession. Well, in view of the fact that last year there was over a billion dollars invested by American VCs in Bitcoin ventures. I think that's no longer the case if it ever was. So it's a very serious topic. The only slightly worrying aspect from my point of view is smart contracts, which are effectively self-executing contracts or self-executing -ex contractual provisions that operate via the blockchain, which could theoretically eventually make me and Raoul over there, more worried more worry for him, redundant. But uh, as you'll see from the booklet on your chair, I think we're safe for a while yet. Um, we'll take questions at the end. and at which stage we'll have some further networking and a lot more patisserie to be consumed. So I'll hand over to Angus and George, who are doing a double act to start with. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. This is who we are. As Simon's uh, kindly introduced us, I'm Angus Banks. Uh, this is George. Um, I got into Bitcoin very early. I just really like the technology. I like the decentralized aspect of it. And I like the idea of getting rid of all uh, the banks. So that's the how I uh, <laughs> that's how I started in this route. Um, and then uh, then uh, in the last uh, year or so, the blockchain moved. And then people started to say, actually, there's stuff um, we can do on the block blockchain as well. Now, I'm here, sort of my interest is on the commercial side. So I'm looking at what uh, blockchain can do for business, what people should be doing, what great startup ideas there are in the blockchain. Um, so that's kind of my perspective. And what we're going to try and do today in the talk is, is almost set up one of these businesses and what, what we need. Um, now, luckily, brought George along um, from the No Man Group. So George is embedded in all the blockchain uh, user groups, forums, and what's going on. So he knows really what's going on right at the uh, coalface of blockchain at the moment. So between the two of us, hopefully we can take you on a, a little journey through and hopefully open your minds and get you thinking in the blockchain mentality. Because I think that's the core thing. Once you start thinking blockchain, then it all becomes and it all starts uh, flowing forwards. So. No mention of blockchain can uh, start without a mention of Bitcoin. Um, how many people have Bitcoin, by the way, here? Yeah, so not, not bad. Normally that was kind of zero a few years, uh, a few months ago. So that's, that's quite impressive. How many people have Ether? Just I know one person has, yeah. The, yeah. Right. Um, Bitcoin, you've all heard of it. It was the first cryptocurrency that... that 
smashed forward. It's got this uh, legendary founder, Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows who he is. It's a group or whatever. I'm sure you've all read the um, papers. But that, uh, strange, has not affected anything about Bitcoin. And it's gained massive popularity. And what, why is because of these, Al Pacino. Um, because it's used as effectively the currency of the black market. And that's important, uh, a, well, probably because of its value. I think Bitcoin will always have a value, because a significant value, because it is powering the world's black market. But because it's been road tested by some pretty unsavory characters. So you, what you don't hear is people being, you know, arguing over Bitcoin. You, just, you don't really actually hear that. So that's actually thinking, oh, Maybe, maybe that is quite an impressive thing that nobody can game or cheat or whatever. So that's the first one. And of course, it really started getting traction with the uh, Julian Assange thing when government stopped donations to uh, WikiLeaks and people started using Bitcoin for that. So a combination of the two things started moving Bitcoin north. Why I love it is because it's, there's no middleman. You're just transferring. No friction between that. It's permission. Anybody can use Bitcoin. You don't need a permission. You don't need a bank account. You can just perform a transaction. And it's decentralized. Nobody controls it. You can't switch it off. And all these things, I think, make it a, a fantastic um, innovation. Now. We're not going off on the Bitcoin tangent. I still think there's a huge array of companies and services will appear in the Bitcoin thing, even though blockchain, everybody's talking about blockchain now. Don't forget Bitcoin. It will still, um, it's still pushing forward. And the financial products that will appear on that are probably going to start appearing in a year's, a year's time once all this investment comes out the other side. So that's Bitcoin. But everybody said, hang on, what's Bitcoin made on and it's made on this created on this thing called the blockchain and that's what everybody's excited about because it's a thing that could actually be used for other things apart from bitcoin currencies or other alternative currencies um, the the ledger side of it uh, can enable a whole load of other things and this is what people started uh, thinking about so uh, the blockchain. So, um, uh, if you asked uh, 100 people what the blockchain was, you'd get many different answers along the same theme. But I like to start talking about it with the speed of light. So the problem with the speed of light is that it's constant. And what that means is, is that if I initiate a transaction, the further, uh, the further I am away from that transaction, the longer it takes to get there. So if I was to do a transaction with Angus, and I was to send the same transaction to Scotland, by the time that transaction got to Scotland, we could have already done the transaction, hence what's called the double spend. The blockchain is designed to stop that happening. Um, so effectively, with packets flying all over the world, it's very different, difficult for networks to synchronize because of this problem of the speed of light. So um, what a block is, is an agreed upon space of time in which all the transactions are placed in a 10 minute period. So take, take Bitcoin, which is a, a 10 minute period. Um, all the transactions that are sent to the network are ordered in a block. And um, effectively what happens is that when all the transactions are where they're supposed to be, a cryptographic puzzle is created. So. I suppose the transaction might look a little bit, you know, it's like a, a line of code, my address, a little bit of Angus's address, what the input and outputs were. And these are all lined up in a block. And all the computers around the world that are crunching the Bitcoin uh, protocol are trying to solve this puzzle at the bottom of the block. And when one computer achieves that, it gets given the task of ordering the transactions in that 10 minute period. And then it broadcasts its order to the rest of the network. And then they all agree 
on the state of the block. And that's how they, dis that's how they validate all the transactions in the block. A little tricky, but bear with me. So um, the fees, each transaction has a fee, and the fees fall through the block and end up in the wallet of the computer that solved the cryptographic puzzle, thereby rewarding the miner for having solved the puzzle <coughs> and therefore validating all the transactions in the block. Those, that block is then added to what's called the blockchain, and that can be searched all the way back to the very first Bitcoin transaction. And then a new block arrives, all the transactions from the last 10 minutes go in, and the whole process starts again. So that's basically, that's basically how it works. It's, it's about finding consensus on what transactions were sent to the network in the last 10 minutes. And that's, and that's, and that's it. I hope that made some sense. <laughs> Right, so Bitcoin was the first, first of these, but then we have this massive slew we followed. Um, in the evolution of all this, we have this massive slew of um, other coins. For example, uh, Litecoin came as really a hedge for, for Bitcoin. Dogecoin, tiny amounts, for really good for online yes-no type, type gambling. Um, I like folding coin. One of the problems with Bitcoin, and there's a statistic which I haven't validated, but I kind of like it, um, is that Bitcoin mining now consumes more electricity than the Republic of Ireland. Um, and you can kind of believe that. So folding coin is saying, well, if we're using all this energy and all this computing power just to solve cryptographic puzzles, then couldn't those cryptographic puzzles be protein folding or other such perhaps more, more useful exercises? So there's lots of different takes on that. Which is your favorite on that? Um, well, dark coin's quite interesting, because everyone thinks that uh, um, Bitcoin is anonymous, but it, it's actually only semi-anonymous. There's um, a, a whole array of technologies that have come through since Bitcoin that makes certain coins very hard to trace. Dark coin has something in it called tumblers, and it, uh, it basically mixes addresses up. So the point. One of the things you can do in a blockchain is you can, you can uh, uh, search a transaction all the way back to its original um, entry point onto the blockchain. With Darkcoin, you can't do that because you get one step into where it was sent and suddenly the address doesn't make any sense because the computer has mixed all the, address it, the addresses up together. Um, so uh, even darker dark markets... <laughs> um, uh, 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 using this. And even now, there's another one that's just come on the market called Monero, um, which I think the NSA are rather worried about. But anyway, I won't go into that. Um, carbon coin is quite interesting. Carbon coin um, uh, is uh, a, a pre mined coin, so there's lots of them already in existence. But a large number of them have been given to a registered charity that plants trees. So as the use of the coin goes up, the amount of coins that this charity holds goes up in value and the more trees they can plant. So when we're all out um, buying our Lamborghinis, um, we, can, we can offset our purchase by paying in carbon coin and we know that they're going to plant an amount of trees somewhere which will produce a huge amount of oxygen into the, pla on, in, into the atmosphere. The Coloured coins is interesting. Uh, these are sort of... And this is really the, the lead into. to... Uh, what we're going to talk about next, because colour coins had um, data connected to them. So your transaction was actually moving, starting to connect data to the blockchain um, in, in a fairly simple way with colour coins. But things are getting a little more uh, involved now in the future, as we'll, as we'll say. There we Ooh. go. Yep. There are those ones. Yeah, and those ones. <laughs> um. So that's coins. Very exciting. We're, we're now moving forward in the blockchain. Now people are starting to think, are there any other things we can use the blockchain for? This seems rather cool. Um, and indeed there are. And then for the last year, year and a half, this is where the action's been. So um, take you through it. And this is particularly where I come from. Is how do you set up your blockchain, your blockchain business? I've got a problem. Uh, how do I use the blockchain? Can it help? Could I base a whole business around it? What do I do? So I've come up with an example of 
Aircraft seats, very classic. I want to hire, rent an aircraft, I want to sell the seats on a market, very transactional. I want there to be one seat, one passenger. I want people to trust the whole thing. I want there to be a market so that people can resell these seats. Very straightforward business problem. Now, from what we talked about, you're looking at the blockchain thinking, actually, wouldn't this be great on the blockchain? Because you've got one seat, one sale, effectively. So it's a pretty granular example. There couldn't be a sort of better one, which is why we've tried to use this one here. So, great, I've got my, I've got my seats, 60 seats, say. I want to put them, sale. Where can I put them? I want to put them on a blockchain. Now, what, there are various blockchains, like I could put them on the Bitcoin blockchain, which, which is fine, I could do that, but it would be a very straightforward service just buying and selling the seats. But I'd like, maybe there's more I can do with the blockchain, and maybe there's more functionality I can build into it. So the first problem is, well, what blockchain do I, do I use? I can't make, I could make my own one, but it's going to be very unlikely I can incentivize just to sell 60 seats, a big enough mining community around that who can justify that. The thing about Bitcoin, any mining on the blockchain, anybody who owns more than 50% of the miners can influence the decision. So you need a big distributed network, which is why Bitcoin works. So I'm never going to get the enthusiasm there to get enough people to mine uh, air traffic coin or whatever I want to call it. So what I need to do is outsource that to another, another blockchain. So give my problem and work to a blockchain. Now, we talked, I could use Bitcoin, but as I said, I, I want to do actually more, more than just trade the seats. I want to put the seats on and trade them, but there's other functionality I can use. And that's why I'm going to choose Ethereum uh, as my blockchain, which George. So will. Ethereum um, was the brainchild of this guy, uh, Vitalik Buterin, who's, who's, who's Quite a no notorious figure. <laughs> well, he's yeah, he's in the latest internet superstar in the. In um, the age sixteen, he was editor of Bitcoin magazine, and um, he came up with something called a white well a white paper for something called Ethereum, and uh, his plan was to cr to rebuild the blockchain from scratch, using a Turing complete programming language, and he put the white paper out to the crowd, and the crowd gave him eighteen million dollars to make it happen, which was the fourth biggest crowd sale in history. And um, the Ethereum team did a little bit of uh, hedging on the Bitcoin and lost quite a lot of that, but <laughs> they, still, <laughs> they, they, still, they still managed to have enough in the kitty to, to, to produce this new platform. And what this new platform does, because it has, uh, it's built in this language, it's a little bit like Apple. Apple creates a language, it sends it all out to the developers and they all create apps using this language. Um, it's similar in the sense that they've created a, a language and everyone can go out and start making these things called smart contracts. And I think we go one more on. Yeah, so smart contracts. The way to think about it a little bit is, is like a, uh, the Ethereum blockchain is a cog and a smart contract is something that you can code, place on that cog, and they will just turn each other automatically. Um, so you can write three or four lines of code, you can upload it, and it will execute automatically. Something very simple might be, a very simple smart contract might be something along the lines of Angus, if, if uh, some ether from Angus's wallet arrives in this uh, smart contract at a specific time, the smart contract will then send a different Ethereum rep token, uh, uh, reputation token, which I'll come on to later, um, to another wallet. So it's a simple escrow, is, is a very simple smart contract. But these can be layered in complexity. And the way it was described to me was anything that you can code on a Commodore 64 um, is about the level <laughs> where they are at the moment in smart contracts. But it will, it will increase. And by layering smart contracts, you can actually end up with very complex businesses or dApps. DAPs stand for decentralized applications. And there's a whole host of businesses now that are building these layered smart contracts to produce um, effectively or mimic things that exist now on the internet. 
perhaps something like an eBay. Um, and so there's no server. There's no one acting behind it. It works on a distributed network. So in effect, um, it's uncensorable. It's permissionless, like, like the internet. If you want to build a website, you don't have to ask anyone's permission. In the same way, you can code a smart contract and you can upload it to the blockchain and no one can tell you you can't or you can. Um, as long as you uh, have an amount of ether, which is the sort of oil in the machine, um, then you pay your ether, which is a sort of hosting charge, I suppose, and um, it, it, gets, it gets executed. Um, so back to, oh, so, and just quickly, DAOs are the next step of DATS where you can begin to have an entire organization self-execute using smart contracts. And my company's called No Man. Sorry, yes. Uh, execute on what? Is it the Ethereum blockchain? The, the Ethereum blockchain executes it. Yes, that's, that's correct. What does DAO stand for? DAO stands for uh, <coughs> Distributed Autonomous Organization. And my business that I'm working for is called No Man, and it's a nod towards in the future being a DAO, so there won't be anyone involved in the company as such. It'll execute itself. That's the plan. Um, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I'll report back in, in a couple of years. So back to airline seats. So how can we use smart contracts in this, in this airline example? Yeah, I, th I think for me, Ethereum is, is, I mean, I look at it one way. So one way, it's an outsourced blockchain at its basic level. Second level, it's you can program it as well and do stuff and react and then there's the third level which also people get excited about is the, like is this skynet and a universal computer that's overrun the world so um there's these different levels of ethereum so you can build up so it, it moves it moves from either the computer that's going to take over the world um mm. to simply blockchain as a service so this means now with our with our current so as well as being able to buy and sell we can now put little contracts in for our airline seats. So a good one would be to say, right, I'm only going to take the money. We're going to hold the money in, say, in escrow on the blockchain until I know I've sold 60 seats. And then that's viable for me to then charter the aircraft. Um, rules like that. The uh, obvious thing is, is saying, right, let's Everybody can sell the tickets, it's fine, they can charge what they like for them. Or it may be that you say, well, actually, these 10 tickets, I don't want to be resold, so they can't. So you can put in a contract that will stop them, in particular, being sold. What's great is when people rock up uh, to the craft, they can just show their, their Ether wallet and say, I have um, this ticket, effectively. I own... The private key. Yeah, the key to that. Um, ledger entry um, and then then there's things like uh, you know my cab the planes lay all, all this sort of stuff um, this one's really cool and uh, I'm going to mention this later uh, unlocks your hotel gives you a hotel key instantly all that sort of stuff when it when you book that ticket then it will give you a hotel key automatically. The hotel hardware will unlock the room. We'll come on to more of that. But there's, there's a whole raft of things that can be initiated. But once, once we've done this, then we say, right, well, what's, what's telling me the plane has, has landed or taken off? And actually, at the moment, this is where you start getting into the blockchain mentality is, well, what is telling me that? Because the blockchain is great. It's a solid ledger, crypto, no sort of unbreakable, um, but w the weakness is, of course, any inputs into the blockchain. How, how are you getting that information that's saying trigger the flight has actually taken off? And this leads us down into, you think, right, well, I trust that source, but someone can source it. So this leads us kind of down an interesting rabbit hole, which blockchain also attempts to solve, which is making a blockchain of those of those inputs. Um, the traditional way is calling, calling an API, but you know, do we trust that API? How do we know someone hasn't intercepted it? Uh, maybe we should ask the passengers. Yeah, so, so the way a smart contract would, would work would be to cross-reference different information sources. So you could have uh, the people who are on the plane, um, you could 
well, you can use smart contracts and GPS and things like that. Um, but, but moreover, you can just say, I'm on the plane. So that's one way of telling a smart contract that the, you're on the plane. The second one would be, you know, uh, Boeing tracks their engines. So you could have an API from Boeing saying the airplane is in the sky. And really what you're trying to do is you're trying to come, come up with as many ways as possible to show that the airplane is doing what it's supposed to do. Because as soon as you, because the smart, smart contract can't tell, it can only react to what it's told. So you come up with as many different ways as possible to ensure that you're getting the right information. There are probably going to be businesses that ensure on what's called the distributed oracle. So if the information that's put into the system is wrong and they're legally responsible, you will get insurance to, if you can prove that the information that was put into the smart contract was wrong. Um, so later on, I'll, come, I'll, I'll show you an example of a, a, a DAP that's being used at the moment where they've pretty much entirely solved this problem. But I'll, I'll come on to that in a bit. Yeah, I mean, one of the great things is, is the connection yeah, a lot of people are spending time on connecting physical things to the blockchain. So fine, you can write your blockchain record, and if that's a virtual product, that's easy. It's how do you connect that to um, a physical thing? There's a lot of action in the Internet of Things area where they're connecting contracts to events and things. We talk about Slocket, but um, art's an interesting area uh, where you can, uh, you know, how do you, how do you know what's in the blockchain is... Um, the actual thing that you're doing. And this is where there's another great interest, connecting physical things to blockchain um, events so that you know or, um, that they're actually the genuine one. And once they're in the blockchain, that's fine, but it's how do you know what, what's gone into the blockchain? And it's the inputs that are, are very interesting. People are, are really um, thinking about them. And if you get your mindset into, like, how do I question everything? How do we question this talk has even taken place? You know, you start getting down that sort of uh, rabbit hole mindset. But it's very important in the blockchain. So um, here's some things that are actually using Ethereum. I mean, I'm quite like... I like Colony, I think that's cool. Well, colony is interesting because it, it um, is a completely new way of working. So normally what happens, someone comes up with an idea, you get a team together, you distribute some equity, and um, work begins. In Colony, uh, everyone comes together, everyone has nothing, and you earn equity over time by gaining uh, Ethereum um, tokens. So then I can then use those tokens to sell my shares in the business. So you have an entire open market whereby I'm effectively selling the uh, input that I put into that company. And it means that I can work across five or six different companies and I can, I can have a designed a logo for this one and I've come up with a business plan for this one. And, and it's, it's, it's really interesting um, what that could do to, to how businesses start, especially also with this working remotely. Um, pretty much everyone in blockchain never meets each other. Um, they all work all around the world. Um, and Colony is going to be a very interesting way of, of people working together. And that's actually a UK company, isn't it? Colony? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Um, it, it inv invented by the guy who made uh, Damien Hurst's um, um, diamond skull. Ah, right. Yeah. Yeah, which is strange, but anyway. Right. Uh, provenance is about traceability. So they're looking at the whole traceability uh, angle. Um, of goods, so you know this shirt. Where did the buttons come from? And they're trying to uh, they put all that information on the blockchain. But again, they have the physical problem of how do they know those are the right buttons. So they're coming up with solutions as well to attach um, to the physical aspect of that. Slock it, everybody's darling company. Yeah, well, yeah. this is really interesting because uh, it 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 effectively is a. Um, wallet that has a physical reaction in the real world, which is open a door lock. So if I put Ether into a wallet and it's the right amount, so say I'm paying my Airbnb entrance fee to my, to my flat, I can stand at the door, put the money in the wallet, and the door just unlocks. And, and that's got some quite big, big potential use cases if anyone's got a garage that they never use. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, and this technology uh, could could be used in many different ways. I heard someone the other day say, what if we could miniaturize it and put it in the trigger of guns um, and therefore uh, allow people to either use it or not? Imagine you, yeah. were, you have a, a home defense weapon in the States and uh, you are outside of the boundary of your, 
of your uh, house and the smart contract says, sorry, nothing, nothing happens. Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah. Um, uh, Mycelia is uh, Imogen Heap's project um, to try and keep, uh, I suppose, music IP uh, attached to the creator. And everyone who uses the music um, has to effectively uh, interact with a smart contract that owns the IP to the music. That's about, about as well as I can explain it. It's, 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 it's could redefine the way the music business works. And Lazoo's is Uber, but using uh, smart contracts and tokens um, to ride share, um, which could be, could, be, could be very interesting too. Identity is obviously a massive area for the blockchain. Um, and Citizen Pass, uh, one of people looking at that, although there's, there's multiple people there. They're looking at ways you can um, make your record, which is a combination of your driving license, photograph, all these things. That's the other thing in the input. What are you actually hashing to make it really complicated that nobody could ever um, replicate that? So they're looking at that problem, the problem of uh, identity and storing identity on the blockchain. But one of the... the is it maybe the biggest? Is it the biggest? Uh, it's the first. The, yeah, very the first. first real one that's pushed out there, um, which George is going to explain as, as kind of, the, I guess, the first Ethereum ready business. Killer uh, DAP, they call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Killer DAP is um, Augur. I'll just, yeah, try and, try and explain this a bit. Um, <laughs> so, Wisdom of the Crowds is a. Uh, uh, an academic principle that if you ask, in this case, how many jelly beans are in a jar to enough people and you average out their answers, you end up with a very, very uh, close approximation to how many beans are in the jar. Uh, have anyone heard, heard of the wisdom of the crowds? Um, and um, the more people you ask, the closer you get to the answer. A prediction market uses this principle, but it's asking questions about the future. So what's the price of gold going to be in three weeks' time? Uh, who's going to win a presidential election? Um, if you ask this to enough people, you get a pretty good prediction of what's going to happen. It gets even better when you get them to put money on the line. It changes the whole thing. And that's what Augur is. Augur is a decentralized prediction market that allows people to buy shares in events or, or buy yes, no shares on, uh, on answering future events. There was a very famous example called Intrade um, in the States um, that had, I think at one point it had $300 million running through one market on the presidential election. Um, and you can effectively, um, I'll show you here, this is, this is a uh, 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 an example for now, perhaps. Um, you buy $1 shares, and where those shares <coughs> meet gives you the prediction of who's going to win. So in this case, who's going to win the Democratic nomination? The, the, the prediction market is saying it's 52% to Hillary Clinton. So the problem with in-trade is that it's centralized, and you have to trust in-trade with your money, first of all, you have to trust that they put in the right answer. So imagine, in fact, it did happen. Mitt Romney <coughs> won, a, won a caucus, and all the people who were betting that he wouldn't win um, uh, received all the money because the person within in trade decided that, well, he rather wanted the other person to win. <laughs> um, and um, um, I mean, yeah, uh, it wasn't quite as clear cut as that because, because there was an announcement that said Mitt Romney had one, but then there was a recount. Anyway, they didn't give the money back, basically. Um, and then uh, in trade started gold uh, prediction markets. And the American regulations uh, came down like a ton of bricks, shut it down. Um, it's effectively creating a new information source for commodity pricing and that's not, not looked, looked upon favorably. Um, so that's the problem with centralized entities. They can be shut down. Augur exists on the Ethereum blockchain. 
It is a collection of smart contracts that allows people to run prediction markets on any question anyone in the world can come up with. It's completely global, so the liquidity in these markets could potentially be huge. You could have hundreds of millions of people trying to work out who's going to be the president. And as we know, wisdom of the crowds, the more people, the closer you're going to get to the real answer. Also interesting about it is it's got zero platform fees. You don't have to pay to be on the platform at all. Um, very similar to this would be something like Betfair. Betfair, as far as I know, has a sort of 11% fee structure and has to work amongst all the current regulation. Um, the market maker, so when you come up with a question that you want a, an answer to, then you set your fees. So it depends on who the market maker is that, that the fees apply, essentially. Um, and if you can have many, many different, different markets all asking the same question, the ones with the smallest fees are probably going to be the most popular. So generally speaking, it's worked out at about 1%, 1% fees. The fees from the markets are split between the market maker. So as people buy and share, sell shares, I suppose the way to think about it is as, it, as we get closer to an election, people get a clearer idea of what's going to happen. And they might want to sell their Bernie Sanders shares and buy Hillary Clinton shares. So there's a constant back and forth of share shelling. And these create these fees. So 50% of the fees go to the market maker. And the other 50% of the fees go to what's called the reputation holders. And if we just think back to the oracle um, that I was discussing before about <coughs> smart contracts looking at different, different information sources to try and work out what reality is, well, that's what this is. It's a distributed oracle. And what they've done is they've, in a crowd sale a few months ago, they made $5 million selling reputation tokens, which is an Ethereum token. And the more reputation you have in your wallet, the more of the fees that you get from the platform. But you have to do something in return for your fees. And that's report into the system what happened. So effect effectively make uh, markets resolved. So who won? The machine doesn't know who won. It needs to be told who won. And so by sending out the reputation tokens across the planet, they've spread them out location-wise, so it's very difficult to get all the reputation holders together in one place to collude on a particular answer. The other way would be to buy enough reputation tokens so that you could uh, uh, essentially tell a market uh, with, uh, the wrong answer. But because it's on the open market, by the time you've bought your last reputation token to skew a market, you've spent hundreds of millions on that last reputation token because you've had to buy up the whole market. And anyway, people would notice. So it essentially saying, what it's saying is, is that um, by having a distributed oracle in this way that are incentivized financially to tell the truth, um, you can then guarantee that the machine gets told the real answer to a market. And therefore, the smart contracts can make the right decision as to who won and who lost. If I lie, it's, there's something called the variance algorithm, and they can tell if you're lying by the average answer. You lose reputation, so you lose money. If you uh, uh, stay within the, the, the mean, uh, uh, well, so you don't lie, you tell the truth, um, you gain the reputation from those that lied. So generally speaking, if this becomes Betfair on a global scale, <coughs> If you hold a lot of reputation, you could make a lot of money, in theory. So that's, 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 that's the plan with this one. And um, what's interesting about it is because it's on Ethereum, because it's using smart contracts, it's uncensorable and cannot be taken down, which I think is going to have some, some legal implications. <laughs> Um, All right, there we go. Yeah, the, I mean, that's the key thing about it. You have to be very aware that you can't stop a blockchain, which is why I'm, I know, um, for example, the bank's putting a lot of money in blockchain investigation, but are they really going to go down the route to something they can't control, maybe a local blockchain, but not a real centralised distributed one? Because people may not understand that nobody controls these things, and once they're off, um, you know, in theory, they're off. Anyway, uh, Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Angus and George. I hope you all understood more of that than I did. Um, <laughs> not true. I understood everything. Um, <laughs> hands over now to my colleague, Raoul Lama, who will talk about the simplicities of the law. So, George ended with a great phrase there. Are there going to be any legal implications, he said? And the answer is just a few. Uh, to be honest with you. So, look, I've only got 10 minutes, and I know you're a captive audience, and those doors are firmly sealed, but I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. Um, the fun thing about blockchains um, for lawyers is that just as blockchains are for technologists, um, virgin snow, sort of a field in which no one's yet left any footprints, so they are for us. We don't really know what the law will be. Um, and I say that we don't know what the law will be. I mean, that's because there isn't any at the moment. Um, Last night, I did what every good legal speaker does before they give a talk, and I went on the internet to do some research. Um, and I went on, it's, it's not called Google, I went on to one of the big legal research databases, and I decided to do a really sophisticated search. I widened the parameters out to be as wide as they could be. So I said, everything in Europe, everything in the UK, statutes, um, case law, journal articles, everything. And I typed in the word blockchain to see precisely how much law we were dealing with. Uh, and the answer is that we're dealing with absolutely none. There hasn't been a Act of Parliament which references blockchains. There hasn't been a High Court case which references blockchains. So we've got complete virgin snow ahead of us as lawyers. But the problem with virgin snow is that not only has no one left any footprints in it, but you don't know what's underneath it yet. So if you've read the little pamphlet in front of you and you think, gosh, that's sort of slightly vague future gazing. Um, you know, these people sound like they're looking at the future and don't really know. That's because no nobody in the legal profession does. Yeah, so all we can do is highlight the risks as we go along. Um, the first thing to note uh, is that blockchains all run on some kind of crypto intangible, as I've dubbed it. And I think that's a really sexy, cool title. So if you want to use crypto intangibles, uh, if you could just credit me, please, that would be wonderful. Um, I don't know. I should, we should come up with a blockchain whereby you pay me uh, some kind of currency every time you use it. Um, as I say, they all run on some kind of crypto intangible. So in early days, that's bitcoins. You've got bitcoins. They are intangible. Um, in Ethereum, you're going to have Ethereum tokens and reputation tokens, which are your intangible, which drives the system. Uh, the interesting thing is that those things aren't necessarily property. Um, I mean, what are they? I, Angus, George, they are, I'm right in saying, just sort of strings of noughts and ones which exist in a system. There's no physical token. There's no document that anybody could hold up and say, here's my token on the system, which makes it quite difficult to define them as any kind of property that the UK courts would recognize. Because, of course, something that's intangible in UK law, like copyright, is only pro property if Parliament says it is. And what don't we have with crypto intangibles? We don't have any kind of act of Parliament recognizing that they exist. So at the moment, you are dealing on systems that run on chips, widgets, intangibles, that aren't in any way property, and which it's really quite difficult to legislate or, well, to legislate for and to litigate over if there's any kind of dispute. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that even if you do find a way to litigate um, over these things, it's, they are immutable, irreversible systems, and they can't be reversed at the whim of a court. The whole point of a blockchain system is that it runs on huge numbers of users agreeing and saying the following thing has occurred, therefore the following transaction should or shouldn't take place. There's no way of undoing that as a single actor, um, we're in a system where everyone keeps the ledger, so there's no ledger keeper you can go to and say, excuse me, chaps, I've been defrauded, or I'm just an idiot, I've made a mistake on the system, and I would very much like my money and or my asset back, please. No way of doing that on a blockchain system. So you're left with a whole new risk when you transact via a blockchain, which is that you don't have the backstop of going to an arbiter or a court who can compel a transaction to be undone or redone in your favor if you've been defrauded. Um, Angus and George, you're probably going to tell me that one of the great joys of blockchains is that they should reduce the capability for fraud. The whole point is that these are transparent, open systems between users. And I would fundamentally disagree with you. I don't think that there is any way, any system that mankind could invent whereby we'll eliminate the risk of fraud being perpetrated across it. Even if the system itself is perfect, it exists in the real world, and the real world isn't. People will still lie to each other, cheat one another, hold themselves out as somebody that they're not on the system, whatever. Anyway, it's all in the book. You'll find 100 dull examples which I dreamed up on, on my own um, in my horrible, twisted, mistrustful way of other people. And there are a whole load of ways you can defraud people on a blockchain. So there's your manual right there. Uh, it's not a panacea against fraud. Um, 
Also, it's not a panacea for contracts. The interesting thing about English law is that it will imagine contracts into being, even if you don't write one. So where two parties in get, enter into a smart contract to sort of sell widgets in return for bitcoins, whatever it happens to be, UK law will imagine a contract into being, even if you haven't signed a paper document. So it's still there. Don't think for a minute that the other party, if they're not happy with the way that your smart contract works, if it doesn't work the way they expect or it doesn't work in a way they think is fair, don't think for a minute that they're bound into the smart contract and that the usual hidebound rule books don't apply. They do. They can go to court and they can sue you for their money back if they feel like it. So, sorry, smart contracts, but like cockroaches, lawyers will persist, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, right. Well, yeah, data protection. Uh, the other thing that sort of strikes me about um, blockchain systems is that they run, the entire concept that underpins them is that they run on open and complete ledgers of everything that's ever happened on the chain. That's why it's called a chain. Um, the problem for that is that when you bring consumers into it, we're very lucky to live in the EU, which has some of the most advanced data protection regulation in the world. But the minute that we start involving individual consumers rather than B2B um, transactions, we have to protect their privacy. And it's quite difficult to do that on a chain whereby you're recording every transaction that every individual on it has ever made if we're naming those individuals. How can we, and I know I talked to Gary the other day, who's frowning at me here from the front row, um, who said there are indeed ways that we can lock down ledgers so that only the people who matter can see various bits of the ledger that they need to see. I'm yet to see a system that works, but Gary, correct me if I'm wrong, that their systems exist. But that is one of the big risks for blockchain companies. How do you isolate the ledger and keep consumer details from falling into the wrong hands where you're doing a consumer system without compromising the the function of the blockchain itself and stopping every system from seeing every bit of information that it needs. Do answers exist? Maybe they do. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, but there's, that's the risk, and that's the thing to guard against. The other thing to guard against is that they are complete records of every transaction that's ever happened on a blockchain. And the EU, as you'll know, um, gives us a right to privacy, a right to be forgotten, a right not to have our data processed for any longer than is reasonably necessary for the transaction that we're engaging in. So it's quite difficult in a blockchain world to come up with some system whereby we're going to chop off the bottom of a consumer-focused blockchain every X number of minutes, if that makes sense to you, so that we're not holding consumer data for any longer than we need to. Is there some kind of encryption way of solving that? And I know we talked about dark coins earlier, tumblers, which might well be your way of anonymizing the data and making sure that data that goes back a certain amount of time um, is no longer relevant, no longer identifiable. But of course, the minute we do that, we enter into a pseudonymous ledger, which brings us all the usual risks that dark coins and bitcoins bring with it, which is that we can't identify the parties anymore, and anybody acting on bitcoin could be anybody in the real world, and we can use them for buying, selling services, which governments have been very clear that we ought not to buy. So there you go. And finally, I mean, and I'm, I'm keeping this short because I've got an eye on the time, the real risk of, um, the real legal risk for blockchains is that things might get legal. Because at the moment we have a system whereby the law of blockchain exists solely in the spaces in between other laws. Uh, we are looking at a future whereby there will be some kind of regulation for blockchain services. Um, and interestingly enough, there was a huge list of businesses a couple of slides ago they're not slight, sorry, that's a, that's a different thing. Uh, a few sort of acts ago in um, George and Angus's talk, which gave a list of businesses, and as we ran through them, every single one of them, I think, rang some kind of alarm bell for me, because just, well, <laughs> it's what I do, I can't help it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I um, because there are all sorts of acts of parliament which forbid all kinds of activity, which, while we can decentralize it and put it on a blockchain, doesn't make it okay. So, for example, we talked about collaborative working. The idea that there might be crypto securities on a chain. Hang on. Has everyone digested the word crypto sec securities? <laughs> Good, uh, by which I mean um, equity assets, things like shares in companies which exist solely on blockchains. Um, if you're an incredibly boring person and you've got one standing in front of you, you'll know that the Companies Act in the United Kingdom forbids people from trading anything which looks, sounds and feels like a share but which isn't clearly labelled as a share and registered at Companies House. So if you have a UK company and you're allowing it to be controlled by widgets floating around in the ether, crypto intangibles, if you're allowing it to be controlled by means of a blockchain, 
kind of blockchain system and widgets we have on the blockchain, you may well find yourself in serious problems should Companies House ever get to learn of that. If these crypto intangibles are granting things like voting rights over a company, rights to appoint board members, rights to receive dividends, all the rest of it. Because if it looks, sounds, and feels like a share, it should be regulated by a share. So think of that. The other one, we talked about um, gambling, uh, Augur, over the internet. And it's, quite, it's all very well to say, well, it's decentralized, and I can't be prosecuted at all for running Augur. But of course, if you're participating in illegal, unregulated gambling in the UK, or if you're making a market for unregulated gambling in the UK, no matter where in the world you happen to be based, you can be sure that the UK Gambling Commission will be all over that. Um, again, no prosecutions so far for Augur, I know. Um, that's probably because, how many people in this room had heard of Augur before we walked in? <coughs> One, two, Three. Yep, that's probably pretty much the UK Gambling Commission's response at the moment, I imagine. So but I, I think as soon as they discover decentralised gambling networks on the internet, they'll be very interested not only to learn about that and prosecute it, but also to tax it, because of course that's what it's all there for. Um, so there we go. Anyway, the point is that in the future, the treatment of blockchain software is <laughs> uncertain. We don't know what it will be. It could be it could be very favorable to business, it could be very favorable to consumers, but the real thing to think about is who's going to be doing the regulating in the future. It's highly unlikely to be UK parliaments because A, MPs aren't necessarily renowned for being wildly technical people, and B, because blockchains, as fascinating as we might find them, just aren't that sexy an issue for the public at large. So these are unlikely to get a great deal of time on the floor of parliament in the chamber. Far more likely that the European Union will be doing the regulating because, of course, there is a whole arm of the European Commission dedicated to coming up with regulation for the digital space. And they will latch onto this. And the EU's usual treatment in legislative space is to be ruthlessly pro-consumer rather than pro-business. So it wouldn't surprise me if you are any kind of investor, any kind of entrepreneur going into the blockchain space to see rather more pro-consumer regulation uh, than you've seen in the past. Indeed, you haven't seen any regulation in the past, but expect some in the future. And it might not be the regulation that permits the Wild West of decentralized networks in quite the way that we were hoping for. Um, that's all I have to say, because that's all the law gives me to say at this present time. So I guess I will hand it back to Simon, and we'll probably do questions in that case.